Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to this latest edition of Tales from Outer Space, where I take stories from across the internet and read them for your entertainment. This particular story is called Top 8 uh, 10 Facts About Terrans, written by Legion Warrior. Jada Hop smothered her fur out with a slender paw, looking over at the light. Her co-host was untangling his tentacles as he was practicing his surprised expression in the mirror. Ready? The light swiveled his eyes towards Jada Hop. Might as well. The sooner we knock this out, the sooner we can knock off. That is a Terran expression, is it not? Just trying to get in the mood, Jada Hop. Jada Hop shook her shaggy head as she reached a practice pour out towards the control board, silently counting to eight as the jingle played. She beamed towards the trio pickup. She put on her best welcoming expression as her co-host started talking. Hello, sentience, and welcome to another top eight, ten, sorry, Top 10 facts about your fellow sentient species. And today we are looking at humans from Terra. The species that surprised us all when they emerged from the galactic stage last mega cycle. Blue Light kept looking at the pickup as he waited for Jada Hop to read her lines, trusting that the producers would insert the proper graphics on the wall behind them as they worked their way through the script. And what a surprise it was, too. And what it is the top 10 facts about humans, Blue Light. Starting with number 10, humans give live birth to underdeveloped younglings who require years of dedicated rearing to become productive members of society. Sounds wasteful, but it leads us to number 9 on our list. Humans will viciously attack anyone or anything that threatens the well-being of their younglings. Nap to and including the once great Holy Continuum Syndicate Nomadic Knight. Vulite did his best to look shocked as he took his turn speaking knowing that the producer would take the opportunity to flash some of the most gruesome imagery of the Terran Kenite War. The fires are still raging on the Kenite's home planet, by the way. Use a base 10 instead, which is why this list has two more entries than usual. Jada Hop bobbed her head, peering at the teleprompter to make sure that she remembered a line. And that's very weird, since all humans only have four limbs. Vulite lifted eight of his tentacles to highlight the odd number, leaning forward as he spoke. Even weirder is that they only walk in two of those limbs, which is why bipedalism is number seven on our list. How can they do that and not fall over? Only humans know. Number six, humans have fought wars since before they discovered spaceflight. But I hear you hiss. Against who? You need two species for making war. Jalhop shook her shaggy head in negation. Humans don't. They have been fighting themselves for all their entire recorded history, for all sorts of imaginary reasons. Unique among sentiments who achieve interstellar recognition, how did they ever get into space? That is number five on our list. Humans first reached space by riding barely controlled explosions, and they still prefer doing it that way, instead of using a perfectly safe matter transmission. The light flashed the most practiced shocked expression. Utter madness. As is the fourth item on our list, humans will eat anything. Plants, fungi, meat. If it is there, a human will likely consume it. So better watch out if you don't want to feel those teeth cracking your exoskeleton. Number three. Humans will try to mate with all and any sentient. So those teeth may not be trying to eat you in a literal sense. Jada Hop blushed a practice pale green. Knowing that some of their viewers were already busy sending complaints over the hinted at impropriety. On cue, the light wiggled his tentacles as he went on. Or they might, if the human is hungry enough. Number two, humans require 1.3 million joules of energy through their food every single day. Most species could feed a family on that for an octal base. And after all of that, you're wondering what can possibly top all of that? What weird fact can be outweirding all of those other seven, uh, sorry, nine? What could beat taking down a star empire for threatening their younglings, walking on two, two legs, riding explosions into space, and being all consuming omnivores? The light looked at Jada Hop. Jada Hop looked at the light. Then Jada Hop turned to the Tridio pickup and prepared to deliver the final fact. Just one thing could. Number one on our list with the top eight, uh, ten facts about humans that will shock you. And it is. Humans are mostly harmless. Jarahop nodded and blushed a less practiced and more genuine green. 
Indeed they are. Cute too, I must say. Unless you threaten their younglings, of course. Of course. They both sat for a second as the light dimmed, then relaxed. That's a wrap. That is another Terran expression, is it not? Indeed it is, Jinnahap. Want to start coming up with ideas for the next show? I'm sorry for light, but I'm meeting Josh from marketing. Ah, he is a Terran, is he not? Indeed he is, Velight. He has invited me on a date, whatever that is, and said that he could show me even more amazing things about humans. Story number two. A colorful first impression, written by Dark Prince 010. The Piscean ambassador merchants seemed delighted with the gift as they swam through the halls of the ship. Fear explained the features one by one, a bit of pride as the thoughtfulness and thoroughness of the passion project creeping into a tone. And we remember that you mentioned a fondness for stargazing, so we ensured that there were not only numerous viewports and view bubbles, she explained, waving a hand towards several bulged-out windows, but we also ensured the main di the, the, the main congregation hall of the nearly room-length window as well. Dia had to catch herself. She had nearly called it a dining room and possibly upset the Piscians. They resembled Earth vertebrate fish, albeit with far more and far daintier fins than seen on most Earth's underwater species. However, they were, for lack of a more polite term, filter feeders, consuming small flecks and bits of algae and detritus rather than the smaller fish, as was the norm for the countless Earth species. As the Piscians made several motions with their fins, even without her translator scanning and interpreting the gestures into her ear, she recognized them as signs of appreciation. Then came a more complex gesture, one she waited patiently for her translator to pick up and read back to her. Hi, crafter dear, they said, causing her to blush slightly at the ridiculously formal designation given that she was just a simple craftswoman and engineer. We commend you on your kind for your diligence and your eye for perfection. Indeed, when you first proposed such gift, we admit hesitance. Much of the human spacecraft contain edges and angles that are not conducive to a comfortable and relaxed swim. They flowed their fins back and forth by way of demonstration. Dyer beamed. That had indeed been on top priority for her group and she had gone over the design with a meticulous eye, ensuring there were no sharp angles or crevices within the crew compartments. Certainly, it required more effort than she typically put into StarCraft design, but she felt that it was important to make the best first impressions possible with these aliens. The United Worlds office that had assigned her the project emphasized that the Piscians were renowned for their craftsmanship and artistic inclinations, a strong relationship with them might be an opening humanity sorely needed to earn respect among the intergalactic high society. So far, everything seemed to be going well. Dyer had just finished showing them one of the many particulate feeder systems and the touchless activation centers when something that had been bothering her in the back of her mind clicked. She finished the presentation as quickly as she could without causing offense, thanking them warmly but with her thoughts elsewhere as the wave signs of gratitude and safe migrations. Fortunately, the fabrication office was within the same shipyard as the dry dock that she had just left, and she nearly sprinted back, slamming her still dripping helmet into a desk as she began hurriedly pulling off her wetsuit gloves. She wiped her hands, mostly dry, distractedly with her day shirt draped over the chair before she frantically shuffled through the design schematics and module outlines. Oh, careful there, you're dripping on the blueprints. It was her assistant, Eugene, who came in carrying a steaming hot cup of tea. Did the Pisians like it? I hope they did, he asked. Yes, yes, I think they liked it, but I need to find out where is it? She hurriedly shuffled through the designs. Maybe I can help you find it. What are you looking for exactly? Asked Eugene, putting down the cup of tea. The color swatches for the interior enameling. They're not coral. Oh, that's right, Eugene replied. The manufacturer said last minute that they weren't able to source enough of that exact shade of enamel powder to cover the fabrication at the scale that we had requested. They said that they had a similar color that they were using as a substitute. I think I might have glanced at it, but it seemed like the same part of pastel that you were looking for, right? With a feeling of both victory and dread, Dyer finally found the color swatch she was looking for 
and let out a low groan. She sighed through gritted teeth, turned to Eugene and said, I know it may not have seemed like it at the time, but that is a really bad decision to make. Why? Eugene asked, worry creeping into his voice. Well, this is what we had requested. She held up a swatch of orange pastel coral. You said it was something the Piscians would like, given their homeworld has some pretty magnificent reefs, right? Exactly. But this is what they sent, she said, holding up a second swatch. This one was also pastel, a very similar tone, but more of a pink instead. I don't see what's the... Oh. Oh no, Eugene groaned, slumping into a chair just as the signal came through to the multi-phone in Dyer's office. She took a long breath, glancing at the color identification to confirm that it was the Piscians. It's them, she said, before hitting the accept button. The voice that came through was robotic and stilted, the automatic translator's rendition of the swirling motion of the fish-like aliens. Hey, crafter dear, we again express our gratitude for the gift, but we must also express some degree of confusion at a disconnect. The colors within the ship caught our eyes at being quite pleasing and almost resembling some of the reefs and fonds of our home world. But when we tried accessing your home database to query the name of the scholar, it responded with the name of one of your species of fish, a, a creature that you other representatives have previously spoken of as seeming somewhat akin to our own, though, though far less developed. However, when we looked up examples of these creatures, these, uh, salmon, we found they display many brilliant hues of crimson, burgundy, green, silver, and blue. Yet, we did not find any colors matching our ship. Hi, crafted dear. Why is the color salmon pink? End of story. I'd quickly like to thank the T5 peeps. Cold War Boomerwaffen, Severin Cerberus, Bushmaster 177, Henry the Red, Caspar Arnholtz, Cold War Boomerwaffen, Elijah Silvercross, Dragzoon WRE, and Severin Cerberus. Thank you very much.